So good morning, everybody. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here to give this presentation on uh, post-quantum cryptography. Um, thank you very much, Tsuyoshi, for introducing me. I'm well aware of the fact that most of you are, well, I mean, you're sort of more physicists than computer scientists in the audience, so I try to um, explain it in such a way that it is hopefully accessible to you. Um, Tsuyoshi Takagi already mentioned uh, as, as something that we are currently doing in Darmstadt. If you want, want to have a look, um, we have a big uh, collaborative project, a collaborative research center crossing, which is a funding format of the German Research Foundation. And in this, it is about cryptography-based security solutions. And in this um, project, physicists and computer scientists collaborate. So what we try to do is we try to, and this is also something that I'm personally very in interested in, we try to integrate um, a security technologies that come from quantum cryptography on the one side and that come from um, traditional computer science cryptography on the other side. I will not go into the details. Two of my colleagues, physicists, um, um, Gernot Alba and Thomas Walter, uh, they are working on a project which is called Quantum Key Hub in which um, they try to um, enable uh, four participants to exchange uh, keys without the um, central a device not knowing what the keys are. I don't want to talk too much about this now, but I would like to start um, with my talk. And uh, post-quantum cryptography is about public key cryptography, as you all know, because quantum computers can um, break all uh, known quantum cryptography and uh, public key cryptography, and therefore I would like to start with public key cryptography. You are probably all familiar with this, but um, um, there is two important technologies here. This is public key encryption. So in public key encryption, you have a public key and a secret key. The plain text is encrypted using the public key. We obtain the ciphertext decrypted using the secret key and obtain the plain text back. And the important fact is that there is no need for prior key exchange. The public key can be published and this simplifies key distribution or key management, for example, on the internet. So that's the one technology that we may want to have, and the other technology is dig digital signatures. That is kind of the other side of the coin. So you have a document. This time you start with the secret key. The secret key is being used to sign the message. So this is only, be, this is only possible for one person. We obtain a signature. The verification can be done by everybody. And then the result of the verification is either valid or invalid. Now, where do we need this? And um, when I started to work on cryptography, people were saying digital signatures are pretty useless. Well, first they were saying we can sign electronic contracts and then nobody was doing this and so forth. What I'm saying now is IT security really relies on public key cryptography. And here is the um, two situations where this is obvious. So if you have communication on the internet, so you have a client, for example, a PC or a smartphone, and you see the smartphone and the PC on the left side, and you want to communicate with, for example, Amazon, eBay, or other um, service providers, then you need some kind of protection. And this kind of connection you have billions of daily. 
And how are they protected? Well, they are protected by the Transport Layer Security Protocol, TLS. And TLS uses public key encryption and signatures. So if we would have no signatures, no public key encryption, well, there's variants that would need uh, only signatures, but then we would have no TLS. So public key cryptography is relevant, is important, is um, indispensable for the protection of the communication on the Internet. Here's another important example. This is software downloads. <coughs> for example, the <laughs> Volkswagen software. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> Uh, you see the Volkswagen on the left side, anyway. So, <laughs> anyway, so what happens is um, modern cars, for example, are on the Internet. And obviously, um, uh, smartphones and PCs and everything is on the Internet. And there is lots of uh, software downloads. For example, uh, consider um, antivirus software. Um, you get uh, updates daily. How do you know that these updates are, in fact, from your antivirus provider or from some other source? Virus provider. Virus provider. Well, actually, in Germany, many, several years ago, the German government was looking into um, um, having a solution that allows the government to look into computers of suspects. And the way they wanted to um, deliver the Trojan horse was using, uh, collaborating with antivirus uh, providers, sending individuals antivirus software updates that contain a Trojan horse. So this is, but the, I mean, it never happened in Germany. It was a big discussion. It never happened, but it could very well happen. So how is the, um, uh, are the soft, is the software protected? Typically, authenticity is protected by digital signatures. And again, this is billions of communications. So the provider of the software signs and the devices um, verify, and it is very important that this is asymmetric because they must not be able to generate the software updates. They must just be able to verify them. And here you can see... Um, the number of worldwide downloads from Apple App Store, only in billions. So we started in July uh, 2008 with, um, this is, um, so this is uh, 10 million. And now, and this is October a year ago, and this is 85 billion. And this is only App Store, and they're all signed. So digital signatures play a very important role, maybe even an even more important role than um, public key encryption. Okay, so, okay, so how, how does current public key cryptography work? Again, you are probably all familiar with this, but I, look, I, I will give a, a short um, uh, view on this, maybe from a slightly different perspective which I call generic RSA. So the idea, I mean, this was really a brilliant invention of Rivas, Tamir, and Edelman. And abstractly speaking, what they were saying is, look, let's take as a public key a finite group, some exponent, such that the greatest common divisor of the exponent and the number of elements in the group is one. And let's tr take as a secret key the number of elements in the group so that everybody can compute in the group. This is what is meant by I'm giving the group. I can compute in the group, but still the number of elements in the group um, is kept secret. Okay? Good. So this is the setup. So what can we do if this happens? The interesting thing is, if in such a situation, 
the secret key allows a secret, um, a, a secret um, uh, operation, namely it allows to extract, sorry for this, it, it allows to extract ETH roots in the group. So when you know what the number of elements in the group is, you can extract ETH roots. How do you do it? Well, what you do is you invert your secret expo uh, your public exponent E, modulo the group order, for which you obviously need the group order, and then you raise G to the inverse of the exponent E, modulo the group order. This is, can be verified with Fermat's theorem, this is the ETH root. Okay, good, so this is the situation. So whoever has the secret can extract ETH roots, and all the others can just compute in the group, but they cannot. So in this situation, um, how do you encrypt? Well, encryption then does the following. You take your plain text, and then you encrypt by just raising elements, uh, the, uh, raising um, uh, your um, a group element. This is G, I mean, this is the, 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 this is the plain text, to the ETH power. Then you have your ciphertext S, and decryption is extracting the root, right? I mean, and I can do it because I have, I know what the number of elements in the group is. So when you know the element, number of elements in the group, you can extract the, the root, and then here you go, right? And so this is the plain text. It's basically the same, right? Well, so what about um, the signatures? Okay, now signatures is the other side, right? I mean, so I sign, you verify. Okay, so now what is signing? So I can do something that you cannot do. I can extract ETH roots, you cannot. What do you do, obviously, to sign? Well, <laughs> you know, you take a, a hash function so that you can sign um, arbitrarily long messages. So your hash function maps uh, uh, strings of arbitrary length to group elements. This is what you need in order to sign this. And now you have your document, D. And I sign by extracting a <laughs> root, right? This is what I can do, the others cannot. And uh, my signature then is the root. And the others, well, they can compute in the group. They can verify that this is an, a proper ETH root. So they verify by raising this uh, thing to the ETH power and then they check whether this is the hash. hash. The hash is publicly known, everybody knows it. And then they can see whether this is true or not and um, the result is either the signature is valid or unvalid, not valid. Okay, so that is the thing, right? So, so the, the core idea is knowing the group order allows you to extract ETH roots. This enables you to decrypt, this enables you to sign. And um, now the question is, of course, how do you construct um, uh, finite groups in which you can uh, keep the group order secret, right? And everybody can compute in it. This is the question. And uh, this is what Rivers and Shami and Edelman, I mean, of course, they didn't phrase it in this way. They immediately came up with this, with the solution where they had a group where they could keep the group order secret. And the group is constructed as follows. I mean, they take two prime numbers, P and Q, they multiply them so you have N, which is the product of P and Q, they take the group um, which is the primitive residues, so th these are all the residues modulo N that are, wh wh whose um, uh, representatives are co-prime to N, and um, of course you have your exponent and then you have the GCD condition. What is the group order? This is the point. I mean, the group order is P minus one times Q minus one. So if you uh, want to know what the group order is, you need to know the factors, right? 
But if you want to compute in the group, you just need n, right? You just need to compute modulo n. So everybody can compute in the group, everybody, but those who know the factors know the group order. So this is a group where everybody can compute in the group without knowing what the order of the group is. And in this situation, your public key is obviously the modulus n and the exponent e. The secret key is the inverse of this element e, this exponent modulo p minus 1 times q minus 1, which allows you to extract eth roots, right? You raise to the power d. This is the eth root. And then you do the thing that I have already explained. So I don't go into this again. And the security now of this scheme relies on the hardness of integer factorization. Whoever can factor, so if you can factor, if you know what p and q is, then you can compute d and the whole thing is broken. By the way, it's not known whether this is um, necessary. But obviously, being able to factor is sufficient to break the scheme. But it is not known whether it's necessary. Ah, the interesting thing is, this is pretty much the only way to construct a finite group where the group order is hidden. So there's no, I mean, people have, I mean, there's slight variance, but they all, all, they all rely on the factorization problem. So if you want this construction, you must refer to the factorization problem. No variance. OK, so let's look um, at the, uh, the difficulty of factoring. OK, so we need for the, to, to measure this a uh, function. The function is um, ln of u comma v. And it looks a little bit strange to you, maybe, but it is this exponential to the v times log n to the u log log n to the 1 minus u. But it becomes more clear what this function is if you instantiate the values for u. Namely, if you uh, do ln of u, comma, uh, 0, comma v, what do you get? Little brain exercise, anyway. OK, so then what happens is, um, Zero. So the log n goes away. The log log n um, it gets the exponent one. So one log compensates with the exponential. So you get the logarithm of n to the power of v. Now, if you have a if you have a function that has running time, uh, for example, a, factoriz a factorization algorithm that has a ru running time log n to the power of v, then this is a polynomial term algorithm. Okay, now what about ln 1 comma v? Now, in, in this case, now, um, sorry, I shouldn't have done this. Okay, so what happens is uh, this time we have 1 here and we have a 0 here. So this term goes away and we obtain exponential to the log n to the v. And this is an exponential running time. So somehow, if you look at this, u and 1 minus u, if you remember how to parameterize um, straight lines, then this is very similar to parameterizing straight lines. You, have a, you take the first point times u and the second point times u and 1 minus u, and then you go with u from 0 to 1, and then you parameterize the straight line. And in this way, this function can be interpreted as, a, as some sort of parameterization between polynomial and exponential. And this is why they call, um, um, sorry, where is this? I don't have to. OK, so I'm sorry. Somehow th there, is a, there is a slide missing. Um, if you have v between 0 and 1, then they call it sub-exponential. It is in, in, in the middle. OK, so here is what we um, know about the factorization progress during the um, past year. So from this, you can see really factoring 
is became easier and easier over the years. So for example, the quadratic SIF algorithm from the year 1984 has a complexity of ln one half and one plus little o of one. So what does this one half mean? It is halfway between exponential and, and polynomial. Sub-exponential and in the middle between exponential and polynomial. Actually in this time, 80, 4, 85, 86, 87, people were thinking this is the nature of the problem. That this is kind of, you know, factoring by nature is between uh, exponential and polynomial. And then they invented the elliptic curve me method, which has a similar, it's a little bit difficult, I mean, it has a similar complexity. But then Pollard invented the number field SIF. And the interesting thing was we got, it, it, it made the whole thing much closer now to, um, um, polynomial because now we went from one half to one third. Sub exponential and the um, parameter is one third. And then they could factor lots of numbers. For example, the, uh, there were challenges by the company RSA. They were saying, look, I mean, our scheme is secure. Try to factor these numbers. And then they factored the 120 um, decimal digit number that they um, published. This was the quadratic sieve still, then the number field sieve did the 130, then 576 bits, then 768 bits, and now the, the current record is uh, 1061 bits. So only progress in computing power and algorithms was able to speed up factoring quite significantly, but as you all know, um, Shor's algorithm 94 is a polynomial time algorithm if there is sufficiently large quantum computers. So what I feel is on the one side, uh, it is important to um, uh, uh, look at Shor's algorithm and the consequences, but on the other side, who knows whether this is the only progress that we will have in the future. So there may also be other algorithmic uh, progress, there may be other algorithmic progress, and I show you that this is true in a minute, now there is this alternative, there is schemes based on the discrete logarithm problem, and I will briefly um, explain what it is. So this is the discrete logarithm problem. So this time you are given such a group that we had before, but let's say that the group is generated by a single element, so it's a cyclic group, so it's generated by the element G, and we are given an, a group element H. The discrete logarithm requires us to find an exponent x such that h is g to the x. So x is the logarithm to base g of h. It's a typical logarithm definition, right? This is why they call it discrete logarithm problem. This is the other hard problem. I'm I will not explain how the, uh, how the um, uh, uh, um, public key cryptography and, and um, public key encryption and, and signature algorithms work, but um, I tell you what the choices of the group are. And now, and this is very important, many more choices. In contrast to the RSA problem, many more choices. So here is the, cho the first choice, the unit group of a finite field with p to the n elements, p being a prime number. Oh, sorry for this. Oh, no, it's okay. The group of points of an elliptic curve over a finite field of p to the n elements. These are the most prominent examples. Okay, here is algorithms for solving. Same thing, same thing. So again, we have Pollard. He's a really a genius in this field. I mean, he invented all sorts of very, very interesting algorithms. And he has an algorithm which is referred to as pollard row algorithm, and it is um, a very strong algorithm. However, it is ex exponential. Then there were other algorithms. I'm not going into this. And then there is corresponding to the factoring number field shift, they also invented a discrete logarithm number field set. 
and they could um, uh, they could um, find um, a discrete logarithm in a very big uh, finite field. What happened recently, and this is the work of Antoine Zhu. I mean, he was able for uh, fields of small characteristic to get even closer uh, to um, polynomial time. So he invented an algorithm which has complexity ln of one fourth. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. So, it, I mean, things are happening, and this only happened last year. Uh, <laughs> sorry, we're faster than this. In 2013, so the year before last year. And he used this to um, uh, find discrete logarithm in a very big field, very big. Look, I mean, this is 6,168. Um, uh, two to the, this is the number of elements, two to the 6,168, really big. So unexpected progress. So these things happen, and of course there's Schroes algorithm also here. Good, so. Now elliptic curves, the situation is totally different. Polar draw is the, still the fastest algorithm. The only thing we can do is exponential algorithms. There's no sub-exponential algorithm. Yet, I mean, they, they tried in the beginning very hard, but th there was no success. And um, you can see, you know, the, the, the sizes of the uh, groups are much smaller. I mean, you can, I mean, this is like, you know, two to the 79. Remember, I mean, h here, sorry, oh. Here we could do two to the 6,168. This is the record. Here we can only do 2 to the 79, and now here is currently 2 to the 113. Much smaller. So this is why elliptic curve schemes have much smaller keys and um, appear to be more secure. Nevertheless, Shore also is able to break them. So that's the situation. So we are in a situation where we see there is classical progress. There is the um, quantum algorithm of Shore, which could break it all. And what we need is, um, uh, ah, so let's look at the quantum thread. I mean, I don't have to say much about this, right? This is what I was saying, RSA, Algamal, insecure. And the question is, are quantum computers realistic? I should ask you this question. So what I did is I kind of, yeah. And, uh, and probably most of you would say, yes, yes, yes. So, you know, I collected a few um, uh, things that I found on the internet. NSA seeks to build quantum computer that could crack most types of encryption. Well, not true, but anyway. Um, or the supercontract qubit array points the way to quantum computers. And here, Google to build quantum computing processors. We heard this talk yesterday, the dinner talk, very interesting. I think the reason why Google does this is the reason that they want to do discrete optimization. It's not so much about factoring, I believe. Anyway, researchers use silicon to push quantum computing toward reality. So people are doing this, and you are uh, doing this. And so um, this is. Um, uh, this is um, maybe realistic, and there is a, even a Wikipedia page where you can see what the progress is. This is where I look at. Okay, so what we need is post-quantum cryptography. So this is um, cryptography that resists quantum computer attacks and can be used in the future. Okay, now the, the starting point from my point of view is you say, okay, suppose we want post-quantum cryptography. What are the performance requirements? How good must the schemes are? What do we compare them to? And um, so first of all, let, let's see what um, uh, security levels we have um, today. And you can see and a security level is the following. If you, for example, have security level 80, this means if you can execute two to the 80 operations on your computing system, then you cannot break the scheme. Then the security level is, two to, is, is 80. And this is classical security levels, 80, 96, 112, 128 for these years. These are predicted for classical, so when without quantum computers being um, available. If quantum computers are available, you have to double these numbers. 
But now, then you can see what the moduli for um, RSA are um, 1,248 this year, and this goes way up all the way to 3,248. Actually, there, if you look at the internet, people do not agree uh, on the figures really, but um, they are, this is the order of magnitude. So, okay. So now, so what is the performance requirements? First one, space for keys and signatures. Keep them small, a few kilobytes. This is what the schemes can do that we have. Small ciphertext expansion. So if you encrypt, the ciphertext must not be much longer than the original plain text. And the timings, signature, key generation, whatever, should be in milliseconds. This is so, sort of roughly speaking the performance requirements. And I will show you a few experiments later that we made with uh, current schemes that we find that are promising, and then you can see whether these um, performance requirements are satisfied. But this is what practitioners ask us to do. So, okay, now, how do we do post-quantum cryptography? We need post-quantum problems. So, problems that remain hard even in the presence of quantum computers, and there are none, provably none. This is, of course, I mean, when we discuss quantum cryptography and um, classical cryptography, the quantum cryptographers, there is, a, there is an interesting um, a document of the uh, uh, National German Academy of Sciences on uh, quantum uh, technologies, you may want to look at. And the people that wrote this say the following, we, the quantum cryptography people, have security that is based on the laws of nature, while you guys from cryptography can only hope. Well, this is not exactly what they say, but it is like, you know, this is what we sometimes discuss. Anyway, but it is, I mean, for, for, it is true. I mean, there's no provably, I mean, we cannot expect this. We, can, uh, we cannot expect that there is provably a quantum resistant problems. We have no provably computer, I mean, like traditional computer resistant problems. So this is the first statement. And now I explain to you which problems we look at. This picture, by the way, I mean, it's a very similar picture we saw yesterday in the, in the dinner talk. You may remember this. So um, uh, this is the complexity uh, um, this map. So we have polynomial time algorithms, bounded error quantum polynomial time algorithms, for example, factoring. We, the whole thing, the egg is NP problems, and here we have the NP complete or NP hard problems. And what we look at is this area, so the white area. And um, first candidate, solving nonlinear equation systems over finite fields, known to be NP complete, bounded distance decoding over finite fields, short and closed lattice vectors. The interesting thing is that the most general version of these problems is NP complete or NP hard. Not the instances that we use in crypto, crypto, by the way, but the most general have this property. Factoring is not. I mean, factoring is in P, uh, sorry, NP intersect co-NP, so it is a little bit more uh, lower in this, um, in this um, picture. And then finally, breaking cryptographic hash functions. This is, I, I will also say something about this. We will see the, in, in a minute, this is kind of a different situation here, breaking cryptographic hash functions, because this is from symmetric cryptography and this is a different situation. Now, this is the strategy we try to follow in post-quantum cryptography. We do this. Suppose you are given one of these quantum resistant problems. Now, what you do is, you first design some post-quantum scheme which is based on this quantum resistant problem. And then what you want to do is, you want to come up with a reduction proof. So you want to have a mathematical theorem saying, if um, this, this problem is hard, then the post-quantum cryptography scheme is secure. Or, you know, then 
logical negation. If this scheme is easy, the, post, the, the, the quantum resist problem is easy. So this is, explains the arrow. Huh? And this is what they call reduction proofs. But what you would like to, uh, these proofs to have, I mean, the property you would like to have these uh, to, is the following. Not only do you have such a general reduction, you would also like to be able to translate parameters for the post-quantum scheme to instances of the quantum resistance problem. W what, what does this mean? I mean, for, for RSA, for example, if you want 80-bit um, security, I showed you for 80-bit security, we need um, an RSA modulus of 2,048 bits. This is the, the, the connection, right? So the parameter is 2,048, um, uh, and the instance is factor 2,048-bit numbers. This is kind of easy, but here we would like, I mean, the parameters in the post-quantum situation are much more complicated, and you would like to be able to explicitly translate them into instances. This is what several um, uh, uh, reduction proofs don't do. But it would be very nice to have this. Okay, now once you have this, you study this problem. How hard is it in the presence of quantum computers, for example? And when you know the hardness and you have this reduction that translates parameters into instances, what you can do then is... Um, what? Ah, you can then use your assessment to select parameters for um, given security levels. Because now you know, okay, so for example, lattice basis reduction in dimension um, uh, 1000 um, is 80-bit uh, uh, quantum security. Aha, aha, now we have this translation here. Um, sorry, we have this translation here. We know that how the parameters um, refer to the instance, so we exactly know what parameters we have to choose for 80-bit security. So this is basically the thing. And then we make experiments, right? And then we look at, aha, now we know what the parameters are, and then we can look. How efficient are the schemes now? Are they efficient enough? Who knows? And if they are not, <laughs> we go, go back to the design phase. We make them better. Huh? So this is what the strategy basically is. This is what we try to do. Good, so... Um, ah, okay, so l let me just briefly explain to you what kind of um, uh, scientific knowledge is uh, required here. So um, in the design phase, we need to, um, uh, we, we, we want, this is our goal, efficient crypto with tight reduction proofs. Tight meaning the reduction should tr be, um, should sort of consume as little as possible, and this is a linear reduction um, to hard algorithmic problem. This is our goal, and the methods come from algorithmics, from quantum complexity theory, very important because the reduction requires a quantum complexity theory. Quantum resist, and then, okay, now the, the assess problem, how hard is the problem really? Um, there, um, we want quantum resistant problems, quantum time space complexity, and worst to average case reductions. And here again, quantum algorithmics, quantum complexity theory, parallel computing. Well, parallel computing is very important. I mean, to do it in practice, to make experiments, and then, we have a selection phase, so we want parameter sets for given security levels, and therefore we need explicit complexity analysis. So this is basically what we are doing, and this is also what we have to collaborate with you on. Okay, good. No, I press, always press the wrong button, I'm sorry for this. Okay, so this is kind of the um, overview of everything, and now I briefly go through the individual um, approaches, multivariate. This is the multivariate quadratic problem. So you have uh, variables, x and y, typically many, and you have uh, a number of equations, 
and you want to solve them over a finite field, and the degree of the individual, um, uh, here the degree of the, uh, of the monomials, well, the, you, you see that uh, this is only appears quadratic, and one can show that quadratic is sufficient. Solution. Yeah, so this is the hard problem, so you m must not be able to solve this, but of course it is only <laughs> hard if it is a little bigger, so it's not so difficult, but maybe x15, y29, z45. This is a little bit strange, this solution, I must say, because we compute modulo 13. <laughs> it's not wrong exactly, but I, I don't know why we did this, but uh, well, anyway, this, I, I Okay, so the solution is uh, what? Two and um, 26 is three and Z is 45 is what? Uh, 39, so it's six, right? Try it. Maybe it's not true. I gave talks w one time in the Deutsche, have you ever been in München im Deutschen Museum? Very nice, and I gave a talk there and then I showed something like this and somebody had his uh, smartphone and computed this and it was wrong. I mean, my <laughs> example was wrong and then they didn't trust me much anymore. So I maybe I should. <laughs> Actually, the, my, my next example was correct, so I was lucky. Anyway, so you can check it. But this is, I mean, this is only. Anyway, so um, of course, I mean, this is the general setting. We are given um, a number of variables and a number of n and the number of equations m, and then we get the polynomials p1 up to pm, and they are quadratic polynomials. We have a finite field, and we are looking for solutions of the following system, P1 of Y1 up to Yn up to Pm of Y1 up to Yn is zero. This is the problem, right? And it is known that this problem, even the decision problem is NP-complete. The decision problem is try, I mean, decide whether this has a solution, yes or no. Very old thing. So it is a high problem. I should say the hardness of the problem can, is, is under, um, assessment, and so Yoshi Takagi, who is chairing the session, has uh, in, his, uh, um, in his group a challenge online, and you, if you want to contribute to this, I mean, for example, you build your you know, favorite quantum computer, solve it. Right. So. Okay, now, okay, so here's multivariate signature. So what I was saying is, this problem is hard. Not always. There is instances where it is not hard, and they are required. So suppose you have a polynomial that maps um, n variables to m variables, and suppose it is nonlinear, but it is easily invertible. There are such objects. So now we are given affine linear transformation, n, fn to the, uh, to f to the n, and then the m-dimensional vector space to the m-dimensional vector space, and, um, okay, now what we do is, um, we will keep, um, we will keep these individual object secrets, so p, S and T will be kept secret, but then we hide the simplicity of P by combining it with the linear transformation S and T. So we start with the affine linear transformation. Then we have our easily invertible object, and then we have the other affine linear transformation. This is a, pre this is a pretty typical situation Take something easy and hide it. Now G looks like a polynomial for which a polynomial system for which the solution is difficult. So this we can publish. We keep secret the objects that allow to invert this G. 
Yeah, so we can now find g to the minus one, and what is g to the minus one? Well, it's um, g to the minus one, p to the minus one, s to the minus one, and you can see, I mean, if you know, if you know what uh, um, s, p, and t is, you can invert this. This is it. So now you do something that is very similar to what we saw before. Those who know this take a message or a hash of it, use it as um, argument, and then invert an inverse image of G. I can only do this if I know the secrets, otherwise I cannot. Those who don't know this can check whether this is a solution. So I construct a solution because I know how to do it, and the others can verify that it is a solution. It's kind of a very simple idea, really. Right? So th of course the crucial point is how to come up with such an easily invertible nonlinear function. How do we know that if we hide it, it remains, uh, it becomes hard? It's a very interesting question. And people have suggested uh, things where they thought, yeah? Encryption is a little bit more difficult. The reason why di encryption is more difficult is that um, these maps are typically not bijective, so you get many, many inverse images. So if you do it the other way around, and you and compute the inverse image, then you get many, 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 and you don't know what the original objects. So you could do it also the other way around. So this is why, yeah, okay? Good. Okay, so this is the situation. There have been instances where people tried this thing, and they came up with some, um, actually there were, um, there was a Matsumoto Imai scheme, an original one, and then it, 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 it didn't hide very well. So we have a few of these um, schemes to, uh, forging the signatures requires to solve this, and there are schemes that are um, um, currently um, being uh, discussed. And um, they are fast. So this is um, what I was saying. But they have large keys. So we have um, 100 kilobit for 100 bit security, much bigger compared to 1,776 uh, uh, 1, bits for uh, corresponding security RSA modules. So that's the first construction. Second construction, code-based cryptography. You are all familiar with coding theory if you still use um, compact disks <coughs> to listen to music, and you scratch them, not too, ma not too bad, and you can still listen to them because there's error-correcting codes in them. And of course, I mean, physicists in the quantum uh, computing area uh, use error-correcting codes all the time. Now, the problem is the following. We are given a linear code, which is simply a subspace of the uh, two-dimensional uh, of the n-dimensional space over the field of, for example, two elements. We are given a target and we are given a distance. So this is a target vector y. And we would like to find, and we would like to find an element in the code such that its distance is no bigger than t. And the distance is Hamming distance. And again, this is a hard problem. So finding, um, finding um, code words close to a given target is hard. This is what is true. And then, you know, finding solutions of multivariate equations is hard. Now finding these code words, and we do a very similar thing now, make a least crypto system. So we start with matrices over F. And then we, such that G is the general matrix of a GOPA code. You don't know, need to know what a GOPA code is, but the analog of what we saw before is it allows to, so this is a special code. 
a special representation of this code allows to solve the bounded distance decoding problem. Again, we have a secret, right? And then we hide it. I mean, this is actually exactly the same thing. So um, we have a public key and we hide the secret key. And then we, the, 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 the objects which are used to hide it and the um, uh, generator matrix of the GOPA code are uh, the uh, um, secret key. And this time, the whole thing works out with encryption. So what we do is, um, so if we want to encrypt a message, we make it a code word and then we disturb it. It's like scratching over the compact disk. This is the scratch. So we, and then those who want to decrypt it, they have to simply do the following. They multiply with the secret P to the minus one and then they get a code, uh, they get something which is close to a code word and then they decode this code word. Uh, right? It is in the code. You can see this here. It's in the code, right? So it is in the code. You decode it, so, and then you get um, your, um, uh, um, you get Y, and from Y you can deduce what your original message is. So it's actually the same thing, and, and um, it is fast. Again, large public keys. So we have 500 kilobits um, for 100-bit security, and again, only uh, 776 bit for the corresponding RSA modulus. These schemes are much faster than RSA. These schemes allow more efficient implementations, but uh, still, um, uh, the, the keys are big. OK, so now. Let me just say something about everybody has heard about lattice based cryptography, and I show you how. Why, do we, why are we interested in this? Well, lattice based cryptography is expected to resist quantum computer attacks. It has worse to average case reduction, very strong, and it permits, we heard this also yesterday, fully homomorphic encryption. And I would like to introduce you briefly to how this works. Okay, this is a lattice, two dimensional. So you have a basis, B1, B2, and you look at all integer linear combinations. These are these points, right? So, so this is 1 times B1, B2, but 0 times B1, and this is B1 plus B2, and this is twice B2, uh, and this is twice B2 plus B1, and so forth. So this is what the lattice is, and you have to think of this as being thousand-dimensional, which I cannot draw. What we are interested in is finding close vectors in this lattice. So we find the closest vector for a target T, and, some, and we are allow some error alpha. So we tr this is what we try to find. And this target, I mean, here's the target, right? So we are looking for a lattice vector such that the lattice vector is no further apart from t than alpha times the minimum distance which is possible. So for example, if alpha is 1, then we look for the closest lattice vector. Where is it? Here. This is what we are looking for. It's in general a hard problem. OK, I, I think you have understood the, um, uh, the, the general thing. So what do we know about the complexity of this closest vector problem? So first of all, there is instances that are really hard. So if alpha is no bigger than log n to the c, then the closest vector problem, and also for those who know what the shortest vector problem is, is np hard for all c. So this is, so this is here we have np hard for this alpha. There is. Um, easier instances, there is a conjecture by Goldwasser and Goldreich that um, if you take um, your uh, alpha, something like square root of n times over log n, then it is conjectured from a complexity point of view that this is not NP-hard. So again, now what do we do? We need to have f uh, to look at instances which are for example, above here somewhere, right? Here. 
Ah, another challenge. We have a challenge. If you want to see how difficult the problem is, we have a challenge. And uh, there is a variant of this, which is the LWE problem. For those of you who are cryptographers, we will soon have also an LWE challenge online. Okay, good. So, okay, now, now I will try to show you geometrically. This is fun for me because I did number theory and geometry of numbers when I was young, and um, this is related to this. So Gauss invented the notion of reduced basis of lattices. And the a reduced basis is as follows. So first of all, the, the, the angle between the two lattice vectors, this is, this is two dimension, is at least 60 degrees. So the second vector is in this area. And the second vector is longer than the first one. So it must be above here. So this is where you find your vectors for the um, reduced basis. Gauss proved there is a reduced basis for each, for every lattice. Gauss gave a polynomial time algorithm. Gauss didn't know about polynomial time, but it turns out that it's very close to being polynomial time. Sl slight modification. So. Again, and this is now again the same situation. If you have a reduced basis, your problem, the closest vector problem, is easy. Okay, now I'll show you an example why this is true. Ah, come on. So this is my basis, reduced basis. This is my target vector. I'm, I want to find the closest vector, yeah? What do I do? This is the formula. All you need to do is, you, all you need to do is, you need to round the, um, the coefficients to the nearest integer. This is true for reduced basis. So if you want to solve the closest vector problem for uh, when you have a reduced basis, the whole life is very simple. All you need to do is this. And this should give you an intuition how this whole lattice space cryptography works. There is instances where this problem is easy. Unfortunately, this is not true when the basis is not reduced. I also have an example for you. Okay, good, so again, so now my basis is very simple. I have the basis one, zero, zero, one, and I take my target vector 3.4 and mean minus 2.3, and the closest vector to this is three minus two, and I get it by rounding the coordinates. Okay, this doesn't really work. So, okay, so I, I round 3.4 and it is three, I want round minus 2.3 and it is minus two, however, If I take another basis, and this is another basis, now I do the same thing, right? So now my target vector is, again, 3.4, same vector. But if you express this target vector on the same basis, you get the following coefficients. You get minus 560.9 times the first basis vector, 199, and plus 566.6 times 99.98. Yeah, so you can c see that this, this is exactly 3.4 and minus 2.3. However, if you now try to apply the same strategy, if you want to round, right? So, okay, so the, now uh, we have this, uh, this linear combination and we round. So we have 500, six, minus 560.9, we round the number. We have uh, 566.6 and we round the number. And then we look at the, tar at the lattice vector that we get, and we get 33 and 27, and this is by no means the closest vector. So if you have the wrong basis, you cannot do it. If you, if you have the reduced basis, you can do it. This is the basis of pretty much the basis of lattice space cryptography. Nice bases can do things that bad bases cannot do. And so again, you can hide. So now we do public key cryptography. So now you can imagine what we are doing. The secret key is a reduced basis, good basis, allows to efficiently solve the closest vector problem. And 
the public key is a bad basis that does not allow us to do this. And then um, encryption. You think about the question, how, how do you implement encryption when you have such a thing, right? So um, you have a plain text and your plain text is a lattice point. How do you encrypt it? Remember, those who have the secret can compute closest vectors. Those who do not have the secret cannot. Encryption does the following. You have the public key, you take a vector, and you add it. Disturb your vector because decryption with the secret key, if you have W, gets the original thing back. But you need to have the secret key. Signatures? Okay. So now this is left to you. How do you do say, well, anyway, it's not, but you can think about it. So it's very simple. I mean, like intuitive. So how do you sign? Now, remember, signing means I can do something to the method, message that you cannot. But you can verify that I did it. Now, what can I do? I can compute closest vectors. You cannot. But what can you do? You can check whether they are close. And you can check whether they are vectors. And this is exactly what happens. So we have a, we are, again, we have a hash function. Now we sign a document. We compute some point. So you see what happens is the hash maps our point to some point in space. It's not necessary. It, no, it is not a lattice point. Now I sign. I have the power to sign. So I compute the closest vector. You don't have the power to compute closest vectors, but you can verify it. How well you can say, is this a lattice vector? This you can verify with any basis. You have the public key. And then, um, is it close to W? This you can see because you can compute the distance. So this is the idea. Well, this is, ex this is the idea, but um, there have been attacks to the simple idea, you know, you, if you collect many, 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 many such signatures, then you get some sort of idea what the, what the shape of the secret key is, and then you get it, so you have to modify this. People have been doing this, and um, uh, now we have variants. My student Nina Bindel has a variant, which the, she calls Tesla, and you can see now what the performance is, so signing and verifying is much faster than RSA. The signature is almost double, a little more than double, and the public key is much bigger. So that is the situation in which we are. And with respect to um, encryption, my student Rashid El Banzakani is currently working with Intel on um, uh, post-quantum cryptography schemes. So these companies are getting more and more interested in this kind of thing. He has a signature scheme and um, uh, he has um, two um, variants of this, and you can see, sorry for this, and you can see that, um, again, the speed is much faster. The ciphertexts um, uh, are still longer than the RSA ciphertext. There is an expansion factor. The public key is slightly bigger, and the secret key is also slightly bigger. I mean, the, you see what the expansion um, factors are. So this is the situation. Sizes is a problem. Timings is no problem. Okay, now, briefly hash-based signatures. I'm not going into the technical details. I have no, not much time left. But what we had so far is factoring is a trapdoor one-way function. So if you know the co if, if so extracting roots is hard unless you know the factors. This is the trapdoor. And the signature scheme that we have is based on this. We also need collision-resistant hash functions. Now, trapdoor one-way functions are hard to construct, and there is a theoretic, um, there's a theoretic result that digital signatures don't need them. So we have 
a signature scheme which we called XMSS. It is based on an old Merkle scheme. It has minimal security requirements because what happens is we can construct it, I mean, from one-way functions, we can, we know one-way functions are equivalent to signature schemes. So we only need second pre-image resistant hash function families and pseudo random function families, and then we construct this. But on the other side, this is necessary and f sufficient for um, signature schemes to exist. And um, we can do this, instantiate this by using cryptographic hash functions or block ciphers, and we need no trapdoor function, and there is hash functions all over the place, and block ciphers all over the place. So the situation for these schemes is much different. We don't have an individual <laughs> problem, but we have many, many, many choices to instantiate it, and if you briefly look at the performance, then you see um, uh, how, the, how they perform compared to RSA. Again, uh, the timings are very comparable, if not better. The sizes are still somewhat bigger. And this is the situation with all post-quantum cryptography. The interesting thing about this hash-based thing is it is currently under in a standardization process. So um, companies like um, uh, various fine and Cisco are very interested in this and they help us in standardizing it. So we have a project which we call Square Up and you can look it up on the internet and yeah, you can see this. Okay, I have no time for this. I, I wasn't sure how you know, much time I would be using, so uh, it, it's an interesting question. How do we combine this with um, a quantum crypto? Well, obviously, you are the source of randomness. <laughs> And um, it is very important for long-lived systems. If you're interested in this part of the talk, which I cannot give, come to Korea next week. There is the Etsy meeting. I will give it there. So I have to skip all this. I'm sorry for this. And, um, but it's also quite interesting, I find. Um, sorry. Here's my conclusion. What do we need to do? So I think what we at the moment need to do is standardize and integrate into standard applications and XMSS, the uh, scheme that is also a stateless uh, version of its Sphinx, um, should be really standardized. then we should look at the security proofs that we have and we should optimize them in regard to um, being able to really compute good parameters. I showed you this and the parameters are still too big. Then we need to study the, uh, the computational problems in the presence of modern computer architectures, in particular in the presence of quantum computers. This is important for the parameter selection. What do we know about quantum computers? How fast are, are, will they be? Then optimize the schemes for secure parameters, consider side channels, and finally, I feel that we really need to integrate this with quantum cryptography for long-term preservation. Look at um, our website for this project and come to the seventh international conference in, on post-quantum cryptography in Fukuoka next year if you enjoyed being in Japan. Very nice. I've been in Fukuoka last year, so go there. And I would like to say in my last minus 30 seconds, also people from physics and the area of quantum cryptography and quantum information theory are very welcome to submit papers there so that we, uh, the communities, get closer and closer. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So question or comment?
Could you comment on these uh, recent findings on the quantum attacks on lattice-based quantum crypto? Yeah. <coughs> so, um, there have been in the past um, um, attempts to uh, come up, I mean, this, the people have tried this for a long time to come up with quantum polynomial time algorithms for finding short and closed vectors in lattices. Now this problem is, okay, so if you understand this problem well, then some lattice cryptography works in so-called um, um, rings. This is a number theoretic object. So this is an order of some um, uh, algebraic number field. And in these rings, the lattices correspond to ideals. Now it turns out that in certain cases, short generators of these ideals yield short vectors in the corresponding lattices. Now finding generators and finding short generators has been, as, um, um, has been a topic of research many years ago, I started with this kind of thing like 30 years ago, and there is quantum algorithms for finding generators of ideals, and if you have the right setting, even short generators. So in these very special instances, the short generators of the ideals lead to short vectors, but it's, it's hard to predict whether this generalizes. People are now looking into this question. So, so if I understand, you're saying that at the moment we don't know if the lattice-based classical crypto is broken with quantum computer. It may be, it may not be, we just don't, it's too early to say. Well, I mean, we, I think it is, um, certainly you are right, I mean, we don't know, but I think um, we will never know <laughs> unless it is broken. <laughs> then we will know, right? We will never be able to show that it cannot be broken. So there is a, there, yeah, people seem, I mean, in the, so, so first of all, this is uh, the, I mean, th this attack refers to um, ideal lattice cryptography and not to the general lattice cryptography. And ideal lattice cryptography in a very special situation. And this is somehow comparable to um, uh, elliptic curves. There is sub-exponential algorithms for certain classes of elliptic curves that translate into finite fields of um, not so big size, but it has never been, this has never been generalized. So it may be this situation, it may be not. So the whole thing, I mean, the whole field is moving target, and uh, there is a lot of um, research required to stabilize our confidence in um, this. Any question? Um, since you didn't have time to go into quantum crypto, could you comment a little bit on um, what role you might see it playing and in particular uh, kind of as a random number, uh, or sorry, a key generator for other schemes versus okay, uh, a real so one-time pad? Thank you very much. <laughs> I will not give the whole thing, but I, w I show you something. This is very uh, strange with, um, I cannot go to individual. If you think about genetic data, computational or other data that should be kept confidential for a very long time, um, uh, computational uh, security is not sufficient, and I have this example. The NSA has a data center, we don't know how big it is, but um, uh, it is estimated to have something like 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 24 bytes of uh, memory. 
and what they say, what they do, they store ciphertext now and decrypt them later. And the keys that we choose today are good for 20 years and the, everything can be decrypted in 20 years. Is it sufficient to keep things confidential for 20 years? Yesterday it was said I, that um, uh, cryptography pro protected the communication channels, but now this is no longer true. Um, I mean, cryptography protects the, um, the communication, but also um, the archives. And um, if you look at this picture, and I don't want to show you more of this, data in transit, this is data in transit. If you want to protect data in transit for an unlimited time, I think we need some combination of quantum crypto with um, the one-time pad and other techniques. So we have also authenticity, integrity, and so forth. And this is, from my, from my point of view, the way to go if you need long-term protection. Not short-term, long-term. And then data at rest. It's very interesting. If you look at data at rest, you cannot use the one-time pad because the one-time pad is as ba big as the document to be protected. So if you encrypt something with the one-time pad, you end up with a key which is as big as the encrypted object and you have to keep it secret. You reduce the problem to itself. There is other techniques which are called proactive secret sharing. A lot of communication is um, done there and also here in the communication phases, quantum cryptography would play a role. So what I feel is what we should come up with an architecture for everlasting protection in which quantum cryptography plays an important role. Okay. So if we have a few minutes more, some question more. Okay, no questions? If there's no questions, then let's thank the speaker again.